Welcome, everyone. Um, Benny, I mean, thank you for the kind words. And um, without further ado, I'd like to move on. As you know, the title of today's talk is Beyond Humanitarian Aid. Is there a role for civil society to resolve refugee crisis? A case study of Rohingya refugees. I have included my contact details um, anytime contactable. But to move forward, I'd like to cover these in my presentation, which is I'd like to give a contextual background of the refugee crisis, especially where I work in my research projects are. And then, of course, I'll be talking from my research experience. I'll then, with the focus of Rohingya crisis, I'll have two particular personal observations. And I'll talk about civil society's mobilizing ability, that what civil society can do in terms of its mobilization ability towards bringing bigger and greater change for common good. And I'll also highlight that despite civil society promises heterogeneity, current focus seems to be on the humanitarian support. And that I seem, I'd like to present as a problematic issue. And this has been done by predominantly by the international organizations, which I will argue that that tensions are brewing within the host community, while frustration are also visible among the national NGOs and government of Bangladesh. So if we go on like this, current situation may have detrimental impact on civil society scholarship as a whole, as an academic, I should talk about the scholarship and also about the humanitarian development practice, where I, which is why I'm here at BIC to combine the gap between theory and practice. Before I move on further, just a brief footnote, I have included a few images. Some of the images are taken from my own research, but some are from other sources. And um, those are from public domain. And I have included as much as possible to, so the pictures when you see, you'll see that like you know, where the sources are from. If anything is missing, I hope these are from public domain and do not violate the copyright data. But if any of you have any issues, please let me know, I'll correct myself and I'll have no hesitation to do that. I believe I'm in front of an informed and knowledgeable audience. So I'll very briefly run over like, you know, what is global refugee crisis all over the world at this minute. So by the end of 2021, it seemed like you know, we had almost 90 million people worldwide who can be forcibly, forcibly displaced. But it is also assumed that this year, end of February, the total population has reached 100 million, million meaning that one in pretty much 80 people has been forcibly displaced. Alarming, right? So among those people, 27.1 million people are refugees, which is one of my focus. There are other people like, you know, 53.2 million people internally displaced and 4.6 million are asylum seekers. But like I said, I'll focus mainly on refugees where I work, but I'll also mention, I have also led a research as Benjamin said, that also leaked it and looked into internally displaced people in Afghanistan. You probably know this again, but just to highlight the context that majority of the refugees are hosted not in the global Northern countries. I often call them like you know, the flag bearers of the humanity, right? They talk about many rhetorics, talk about aid, talk about humanity, support and all these things, but for geographical reason, for geopolitical reason, for other reasons, most people, most refugees leave countries next to them. So. Generally, like you know, generally speaking, this is the picture. Among all the refugees, almost 70% are coming from Syria, Venezuela, Afghanistan, South Sudan, and Myanmar. And I'll focus mainly on Myanmar today. But as I said, I have also I'm, I also have active projects in Jordan, looking into the Syrian refugees, and also looked into Afghanistan among the IDPs. In terms of major hosting countries, as I was saying, this is there's not many many countries that are global from global north. Germany is there, but other countries like you know, Turkey, Colombia, Uganda, Pakistan, point I'm trying to highlight are not probably that well off to accommodate the huge volume of refugees. And when you have like you know, refugees in this part of the world, you will also have many popular narratives and popular rhetorics, often right wing and some within the community might be contextual and cognate for this presentation in understanding civil society. So the Rohingyas in Bangladesh, that is my focus for today. You see like, you know, as of February and um, there to February, 2022, there are over 900,000 Rohingyas living in a small place in Ukia and Teknaf sub-districts in Bangladesh. 
And the Kutupalung camp, which is very well known, is only 13 square kilometer. There are, of course, like a few other camps here and there, but you can see like how congested the population is. Among the other places where I work, the situation is not very different. Jordan is also a rather relatively small country, but like you know, they're rather spread out in other places where refugees are mainly located in like you know, in Amman and then to like you know, um, Mafrak and then Ibrid and in Mafrak where I work with colleagues at Jordan. So Rohingya crisis, it would be quite impossible for me to give you an overview details about the crisis. But just to give you a rather contextual perspective, I'll highlight something here today. Happy to answer any questions afterwards. So Rohingyas are one of the most persecuted community in Myanmar. They're because, this is because of their like religious ethnic identity. Since Myanmar independence in 1948, they have been persistently denied citizenship and experienced marginalization within the society. Even if they needed to get married, they needed permission, even they needed to do a business, they would have to pay, pay bribe to like, you know, local law enforcing agencies. In 1962, the Niwin regime took Rohingya's right to nationality and um, officially rendered them as illegal foreigners. There have been several waves of violence against Rohingyas. There are like, you know, for example, in 1978, 1991, 2, 1996, 2012, 2016, and most recently into 2017. During these waves of violence, many Rohingyas again came to Bangladesh. So if you would add, add that total numbers, that might put these people somewhere else. So these waves and series of violence led some people to describe that this state-supported violence is a slow-burning genocide or ethnic cleansing. Before United States or some global superpower officially declared this as an um, ethnic or gen um, genocide. The even High Commissioner of Human Rights argued in 2017, after 2017 incident that there, the attacks against Rohingyas were executed in a well-organized, coordinated manner with serious violation of human rights. The UN fact-finding mission, mission also found the attacks were widespread or systematic as in the definition of crimes against humanity. For the human rights, even, even, even human rights commissioner, they reported that this was a textbook example of ethnic cleansing. In terms of Bangladesh, as I said, as of February, 2022, there are nearly, let's say 1 million people living in Cox's Bazar camps, which makes the largest refugee settlement in the world, right? As per UNHCR estimate, almost 90% of displaced Rohingyas are hosted in Bangladesh, making the country an important case study for my talk and then policy challenges for the resolving. I was privileged to um, I was privileged to be able to visit Rohingya field uh, Rohingya camps. Um, here is my um, then research assistant who has now turned colleague, Dr. Exan Kabir, and the Rohingya refugee refugee himself. And um, it was like you know there and um, the camp situation would I, I like to highlight that you know that this is the focus and it relates the focus of today's understanding, the Rohingyas and civil society, the connection between these two and the camps highlight one of the, among many, many problems, the substandard inhuman or like, you know, living conditions in camps highlighted in the right side of the picture. The other topic, as I said, like, and I'm going to contextualize the focus of my topic about civil society, right? So civil society, are there are different types of civil society. I'm assuming that you know, we know that there will be local, national, traditional, and international arms and um, like, you know, um, aspects of civil society. I'm also aware that you know, like recently after the um, Cold War, for example, there was this like you know, formal institutions in the name of NGOs, which have almost like you know, grabbed the like, you know, landscape of civil society and at the expense of traditional civil society, the cooperatives, the informal groups, may not be entirely in the West, but mainly in the global South. And like, you know, the NGOs seem to be equivalent or synonymous of civil society. And I am, I, I would like to disagree with that. And I'd like to highlight this fact with this. So in the discourse of development and human development, I feel this is important. I highlight this in terms of the focus. Moving forward, I'd like to also highlight that, okay, that when you talk about this, it is important to bear in mind that Rohingya issue is an integrate crisis. There is not just one element, right? 
but the crisis has not been created by the most vulnerable group, the people who are paying the most price, Rohingyas themselves, or yes. the state or community yes. that is hosting yes. Rohingyas in Bangladesh, right? The link, I can point it to you. We also need to bear in mind that this is a political crisis. It's not a humanitarian crisis like we see in major development narratives about this crisis. There are some humanitarian element to it, but if tomorrow we have a political resolution, the crisis will be over. We'll need to talk about like and you know, how we move on and like you know, make things make the solution package in effective, right? So that's where I am. Like and it needs to be, you know, it needs to be kept in our mind when we talk about this. So in moving forward. I'll focus on two main personal observations as a researcher about Rohingyas. So number one, there is an impasse towards the meaningful progress, however you want to call meaningful progress or resolution of the crisis, which leads to the growing frustration and to some extent hostility against these vulnerable Rohingya groups um, among the, amongst the host community. So in terms of an impasse towards any meaningful progress, there are no sustainable or dignified solution in sight, even though the crisis in its fifth year. Despite all the rhetorics, despite all the efforts, despite all the like you know, visible humanitarian support you see on the ground, talks, seminars like this one as well, I need to be reflective. You can see like there is no solution in sight in next few years. It's just like, and it's just the case as it is. Bangladesh tried to do something bilaterally for the return of the return of some Rohingyas to Myanmar, or at least to start the process, miserably failed. You can ask me or ask other, other people like why this has happened, but this is the situation. So that aggravates the um, impasse again. So there is also a backstage donorship that donors in the name of, because they are the key protagonist in like the giving aid, coming up, coming with money, right? to provide the basic sub, basic needs support to the Rohingyas. They seem to be in control, which I'll explain a little bit more. So I call that backstage donorship, like you know, where agenda setting, settings or narratives are set behind the, behind the door, maybe not in the public forum and by the donors. And remember that I, international organizations are part of the civil society I call. Also the growing frustration was that local communities feel that Rohingyas are outnumbering and outprivileging them in their own land as I have shown in that small um, map, it's a small place where they have been like you know, placed for their like you know, for their accommodation, and the number is much 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 higher than the people who used to live there, right? So the support they are receiving from international community made this community feel like this way. As you can see, like you know that too much support means like you know, many humanitarian actors provide so many different things. And in some ways, maybe like in abundance, I'm not saying, I'm just saying in some ways, not always. So some of the stuff, because Rohingyas are like, do not have, do not have many cash, they sell it to local sellers, right? This is what I found in my trip. And these local sellers like you know, sell these um, elements, products to the, like, to the um, local community members. So you'll see toothpaste, you'll say like, you know, the toys, you'll see like, you know, what do you call the um, water cleaning, buckets and all these things, the logo, UNHCR, the oils, the sanitary product, hygiene products are there, right? It gives you the, like, you know, the local vibe that you know, people feel like you know, that they're not receiving anything, but Rohingyas are receiving a lot. This was the case predominantly when I visited it. Things are changing slightly, which I must acknowledge here. Also, the frustration comes from this perception that they might, Rohingyas might pose several risks to the host community. So you see, this is the report that says like, you know, that Rohingyas are vanished. The mobility is also an issue. In some ways, my colleagues here, Benjamin and other colleagues who talk about like mobility can be part of the problem, but also can be part of the solution too. But here, if you look at the mobility and how this is like, you know, international media, again, like in you know, a part of the civil, wider civil society, it shows that look, that the report comes to like this, if I do this more specifically, that when the total number was above 900,000, by the July 31st, 2020, it came down to 860,000. Where this like you know, roughly 42,000 people gone? They have not gone back to Myanmar. Many have probably taken risky ventures to go to Malaysia, Indonesia, Thailand, and other places. And don't just think that mobility stops there. Mobility goes further. Some may have done something like, you know, some may have been spread out in the, within Bangladesh as well by taking advantage of by other measures, which is again risky and like a violation of the law, which are they're not supposed to do, of course. So these are the understanding. And now 
when I say that, you know, I talk about the ability of civil society through their mobilizing ability that it can contribute more than just providing humanitarian support, I just briefly give you the broader understanding what civil society is talked about in the academia. So it is comprised of the, it is a realm that, that lies between the family and in the one extreme and the state on the other. So you mean like you know, anything between family and the state could be like you know, termed as civil society from Hegel, 1821. We have moved on. So similar ideas by Anheira, but you'll see like you know, the individuals, the organizations, the institutions between the family, state and the market, okay? In which people have said voluntarily to advance common interests. So I'm thinking, so civil society's role is to advance common interest. But of course, anything between family, market, and state, there might be people who have negative civic, civic space, who might just spread like you know, populist ideas, who might just have other radical extremist thoughts too, right? And voluntarily they're doing this and in the idea under the broad banner of like, you know, pursuing the greater common good or the common interest. But allow me to say it again, that I focus on the mobilizing ability, right? In terms of mobilizing ability, it is told that it is argued that in a, they can, civil society can participate actively and meaningfully for problem solving discourse against for the general interest. And when large numbers of population of a community, town, region, state, or even at the global level, think of global climate change or global peace, green peace, and the movement against plastic, some of this will give you the idea that like a truly remarkable, powerful change can occur when people do mobilize in mass to the like, you know, mobilizing ability and advocacy and other actions from the civil society at the like, you know, national regional levels. So what is happening regarding the Rohingya crisis in Bangladesh? As I said, that little is, I mean, I can only give you the brief. So Bangladesh has taken the lead to coordinate its efforts by involving three ministries, namely the Ministry of Disaster Management and Relief. I have interviewed him. Um, and then like the Ministry of Home Affairs and Ministry of Foreign Affairs. I'll talk about these two later, two later ministry, ministers, what they're doing or saying like in terms of like in you know, a recent, recent state of the crisis. Bangladesh has established the Refugee Relief and Repatriation Commissioner's Office popularly called as RRC, and um, they have included national security forces to deal with this crisis. Although on paper, Bangladesh government seemed to have taken either you hear from Bangladesh officials, the burden or the ownership from other side of the crisis, at least on paper, it appears that Bangladesh has very little, little say in terms of bargaining power about a durable and dignified solution. I've given you some idea that how they failed in terms of like you know, coming up with a bilateral solution, but also see like you know, how they're pledging the international community to do something about this a little later. What we have observed in our research, um, I have been involved in a couple of researches in Bangladesh and one in Jordan. I'll highlight, try to combine some of those. And it needs to be like an emphasize that before international organization, before government, before anyone stepped in, it was the host community people who swamped in large numbers to help the vulnerable Rohingyas who were exhausted, shot, or like you know, unwell in many other ways, traumatized and unfed. These were the people who came up with like you know, basic support, primary health support, food, and they kept them, gave them shelter in their own houses or somewhere near the camp. All right. And this is also visible from like, you know, in some research where people um, Rohingyas in some established research studies from ODI saying that, look, this is the time I cannot forget their warmth, but I will remember this all the time. And my family and my relatives, this is when we feel, feel most respected and most dignified. And there have been like on the right hand side, some pictures I have shown included. We have observed as Bangladeshis that there was a festival like situation, right? People collected, and that's, a, and that's an element of civil society. People, unorganized groups collected truck loads of foods and clothes, and they traveled from Dhaka and all other places to Teknaf to support the Rohingyas. Probably believing the solution, the crisis will be short lived. But as the crisis protracted, as in one of my, our research, we interviewed, as you can see, like in, it is in the fifth year and they've talked about um, third year. So we did these interviews in 19, 20, 
So one person in like in municipality, Tecna municipality was trying to say, look, if people stay for a longer time, it will definitely create problems. Imagine like if a guest comes to your house, you will host them one day, one week, one month, three months. But if they stay three years, five years, it's probably human nature, human instinct that there will be clashes, conflict of interest, and there will be dilemmas, right? So they were arguing that like, you know, this is why if they stay longer, it will create like, you know, anger and hatred amongst the host community. Would that be a good thing? Or would, would we just like, you know, ignore this in moving forward? That's a big question to me. So the Rohingya crisis creates harmful impact and you'll see this like, you know, community leader tries to say like, look, they're, they're involved in various different evil deeds, including drug trade like Yaba, hijacking, stealing and prostitution are most objectionable. And this is not going down. There are environmental impacts you might know, like, you know, this is the picture I took while I was traveling that they have literally like, you know, chopped the, like, you know, demolished the hill to accommodate Rohingyas and all these things. And when some people, a human attractor, when some people went to reclaim their land, they were heavily opposed by the Rohingya people themselves. The, because there is a group contact vibe among the Rohingyas themselves. They are not majority. The majority rules wise, like you know, the locals feel they're like you know, um, minority now. In terms of the threats to the community, as I was saying, like you know, that some people are highlighting, this is also in the national media, right? That it can pose serious threat to the host community, not only serious threat to the host community, but this regional national security. Some of you might be aware of like you know, the killing of like you know, what you call prominent Rohingya leader themselves called Muhibullah. Right. So it gives you the perception that it might be several arms groups are operating and engaged in arms, arms smuggling, local arms selling and kidnapping. And there are violent clashes, which is shown in this in a, both national and international estimates. Right. According to Amnesty International, like you know, 100 Rohingyas were killed in illegal extrajudicial ex execution between August 2017 to July 2020. In local national newspaper called Prothomalo, they reported that like 32 Rohingyas were killed by the law enforcing agencies and the internal conflict from January 21 to May 21. So in this space of five months. So it can give you an idea like what this can do. This is also similar in Jordan. I'll not go into deeper perspective, but from Jordan, um, we are. this is an ongoing progress. We are trying to analyze the data out there. So the male and female FGDs we did, it, it developed a similar picture, like, you know, that host community are angry. They're feeling negative impact. Like, you know, they're having, like, you know, look, there are, like, an economic impact happening, high prices, lower, like, you know, lower high prices of commodity, threat to the security, and, like, you know, um, impact on like you know, economies in terms of wages because um, um, refugees are taking labor in cheaper rates, causing huge, huge tension. And overall, they're trying to say, look, the economic situation was bad already, but it has got worse. It's absolutely negative, right? So moving down, like, you know, Bangladesh's role might not be like, you know, looking that, that, that important in many ways. They're being sidelined by the international civil society, international community, internationally powerful actors in the name of donors and in the name of powerful countries. It is visible through like, you know, through their inability, but it is also visible in the latest Rohingya supporting the um, sustaining support for the Rohingya refugee response conference organized by, um, organized by the United States of America, European Commission, United, United Kingdom and UNHCR. I will show you something like you know, in that video, like you know, when donors came in like you know, in great numbers for that 182 minute video conference, online conference, there was four minutes of a Rohingya video, just four minutes. And in that video, one community worker said this, and you can read like, you know, how can we go back to our village, our homeland? She says each day feels very long to us. One year feels like 10 years. We want to go back home. How can we go back to our village or homeland? We hear the same thing. She says her experience, like you know, whenever she does go to for community, community work. This is different from Jordan. In Jordan, it feels like integration is the main issue. Like you know, they're keen for integration. They don't want to go back to Syria. But in Rohingya's case, they want to go back. And this is also highlighted by the Bangladesh government. The state minister who participated he literally highlighted Bangladesh is not in a position to continue to take this burden 
The prime minister said this like in the United Nations, that they are a burden. Ministers, politicians openly call them burden. And a global conference, the minister is saying that we are not willing in a position to continue to take this burden anymore. They must return to their country of origin. The Rohingyas themselves want to return, and he highlights that at the earliest opportunity. And he pledges international community should sincerely work to create that opportunity for them. He pledges further that international community has a responsibility to work with Myanmar to resolve the crisis, but most importantly, in my view, and relieve Bangladesh from the burden that Myanmar has created. It's not Bangladesh's problem. It's not Bangladesh's creation. It's Myanmar who has created this, and they should, the whole community should relieve us. I tried to write an article, and I have published an article. It was titled initially like, you know, that staging, Staging, staging Hamlet without the like, you know, staging Hamlet without the like, you know, Prince of Denmark. But the editor felt that you know it would be quite difficult to for the American readers. It's too European. So this is what I published at a critical analysis of the conference, where I highlighted that the conference became like a fundraising event, where donors after donors are not talking, despite like you know from the Rohingyas, despite the minister asking for repatriation solution, asking Myanmar. Nothing about repatriation, nothing about sanction, nothing about this is fundraising ability, fundraising event. People were pledging five millions, 10 millions dollars and all these things, and it became fundraising ability. Absolute disaster, absolutely like a disregard of like you know, what people in the ground want. So here we are. This looks like this at this moment, right? So Rohingyas refuging support, re receiving support from the like in you know, national um, so mainly international uh, uh, human rights actors often from the like, you know, what you call, um, often delivered by the national local NGOs. The airport, this is the outside of the airport. When I was a young boy, like, you know, this airport was pretty much like, you know, deserted. Hardly anything was there, but this place is like you know, swamped with cars. New infrastructure is being built to accommodate the Rohingyas, destroying the like you know, environment, the places like in you know, the forest. There's basically hardly any visible borders between like you know, Rohingya camps and like you know, the local people. Right. And as I said, like, you know, there is this, like, you know, the visibility of, like, you know, too much support for the Rohingyas. It is fine that, you know, international organizations such as the UN, UNHCR, and so on, stepped up for humanitarian support. And I feel that, you know, for the cognitive policy negotiations, for the bank at national and regional levels, they overshadowed the role of Bangladesh and its various arms. The events I have experienced in many places, in many places, Bangladesh plays a side role. It's mainly the like international actors who are the central actors. For example, if the high commissioner, rather than a minister of Bangladesh is present, if the high commissioner of India is present, or China is present, or America is present, or UK is present, they're the chief guest, the people want to listen to them. What can they do and all these things? So it's pretty much like the donor conference I was talking. And you can see like you know, that there's a huge frustration among the local NGOs that look, give us active role for the local NGOs. The foreign minister tells that international agencies are NGOs. So you can see the disconnect here, right? How they're like hindering the solution. And this is about transparency, like you know, that international organizations are not doing enough to like you know, use the fund that is available. So there is, these are like NGO leaders in their national conferences. So what I argue is like a donor visibility in the field is remarkable. This is the notice board of the hotel where I stayed, four-star, five-star hotel. I do apologize for safety reason. I had to stay there. But the notice board, as you can see, is like you know, full of meetings and notices from the international civil society, international humanitarian actors. I have, I've seen like a you know, camping charge traveling in like a you know, project cars that is like you know, um, given from the project money, but the donor cars are like you know, absolutely everywhere in Cox Bazaar and in the camps. So you can assume, one can assume that the donors are running the show. So what is happening on the ground then in this context? Why this is a serious crisis and why civil society need to step in? Something you probably do not hear from this in this part of the world. So this is something from the local newspaper. So this lady who is the foreign secretary of United Kingdom where I come from might become the prime minister of UK very soon. And I said might. So this is Bangladesh foreign minister during the Con Commonwealth conference, the foreign minister, Bangladesh foreign minister asking UK foreign minister, who might become the prime minister, that if you are so like you know keen and supportive, why don't you take 100,000 Rohingyas from Bangladesh? And then you can realize what pressure we are doing with. So whatever people talk about in the national and global scale, like in terms of academia and civil society rhetoric and discourses that it could be integration could be a solution. 
or even a third country like my settlement. The foreign minister literally openly reject that like the integration is not the solution, it's the repatriation that's the only solution. And bilaterally, diplomatically, they do this like, you know, that they seek EU's, ro EU's role for early repatriation. This can be seen as a, like an act of defiance to give a message to the world that, look, if you do not do this for us, we will do whatever we would like to do. So Bangladesh has sent a great number, some 30,000 people, Rohingyas to a like, no, remote island called Washancho. Yeah, people, rights groups, civil society was very vocal in this note that this is like no diplomatic, this is not good, this is like no harmful, detrimental, and risky for the Rohingyas. Bangladesh defied their like no concerns. The fact is, they have been so defined and stubborn, international organizations and even now are cooperating Bangladesh because these people cannot be just left there. So Bangladesh is now like no coordinating and even is now part of this process of like no supporting Rohingyas in the remote island called Washancho. This is something more alarming. So this is the state minister. Um, state minister was invited as the chief guest. And you see the demonizing of the Rohingyas, the Rohingya and the narco-terrorism. As if everybody Rohingya is like involved in like no terrorism or like no drug trade. So drug trade has become a terrorism related issue. And you'll see on the side of the picture that like you know, and donors, the like you know, embassy, embassy staffs are present in this meeting, no objection. There's also some mobilization that, that Rohingyas themselves are having this campaign, let's go home in the, you know, for, at, the, at the eve of the fifth year and fifth anniversary. This is what like, you know, draws my attention a lot. A local driver, bus, microbus driver, he was saying like a swear word to somebody as Rohingya. He just called somebody Rohingya. So the reaction was that person just beat that guy and killed him. And this picture on the right is showing like a father demonizing the Rohingyas that says that many people in Rohingya are, have gone like become rich by doing drug business of Yaba. And that's why they're buying sacrificial animals for um, Eid will adha by themselves. So it creates like a lot of tension, hatred, and enmity with them because local people are poor. They cannot afford to buy a cow for themselves. So there are like no other connotations maybe, but this is what is happening ongoing on the ground. Let's not forget, I cannot cover everything. I cannot cover what's going on in Myanmar at this moment in terms of military coup or like you know, the internal politics and internal protest and the armed rebellions here and there. But I'm just going to highlight very briefly that international trade will play a massive role and that means like in that international role, trade is like playing a huge role here. And also the arms supply, some of the leading roles, some of the leading countries are like you know, involved in this, right? So this cannot be like, this makes things complicated, right? My argument is while it is important to maintain humanitarian assistance, which is good, which is needed to keep those people alive, I'd like to draw our attention what might happen if the crisis is protracted to a further significant level. One example could be Moria camps in Greece, where people like you know, refugee camps were torched and it was blamed by the Rohingya themselves who videoed some of this stuff that this was done by the local people themselves. If this happens in Bangladesh, it would be a disaster and it would like and it would cause a massive tension. Rohingyas are constantly receiving negative like you know, negative media, media portrayal, media depiction. And I think like if there's a conflict comes up in, in between Rohingyas and the host community, that would be a catastrophe. So what I argue that from the civilization and from the civil society's mobilization ability, that it can play multiple roles, not just offering humanitarian support for the international organizations and international NGOs, and for the local NGOs, not just service delivery as the contractor of those international organizations. If that is happened, based on the mobilizing ability, I contend that both international organizations and national traditional civil societies should play a more proactive role in finding investigating and offering cognate policy solutions in resolving this crisis. This could be based on the first-hand experience of their work and the frontline field data and participation in many places. In addition to humanitarian support, I'm not denying that need of humanitarian support, but in addition to that, civil society should also play a strong advocacy role for the crisis. If it is the failure, if civil society failed to do that, it would be labeled as opportunist, I think, that the civic sphere will be like you know, mobilized for civil and um, social people. It is important we do this. Otherwise, like you know, it will feel some degree of populism and it will do like a huge harm to the like you know, civil society, developmental, humanitarian, and refugee studies scholarship in itself. 
Otherwise, we might have to agree to some of these comments. So on the left-hand side is a former foreign secretary who labels in an interview that it's not about charity, it's all about business and geopolitics. And on the right-hand side is a Myanmar-led exile activist who argues that after all these years, Rohingya issues remain a cash cow for NGOs and elites, while the genocide survivors in camps around the world have absolutely no future. And I hope this is not the case. Civil society plays massive role and playing massive role in many other refugee crises and many other broader issues around the world. It can take a proactive role and do more rather than just to provide basic needs support service to the like, you know, to the Rohingyas. And at that stage, I'm going to stop. Thank you for the opportunity. And I'll very much welcome your questions, comments or feedback. My email address is there. You can also tweet me and get in touch. I'll be very much looking forward to your comments. Thank you very much.